Morning. Um, I'm here live, Dave O'Brien, Tuesday. So thank you for joining me. Um, those who are watching, because I'm, I'm on my laptop as well, um, I've had a problem in the past few weeks with um, my laptop camera not wor working very well. So it's good to be back on my laptop. And it's good for those who are live watching elsewhere so we're going to begin in a few moments i'll just give you a moment to gather yourselves um, i'm going to share a reflection from a bible passage from hebrews chapter one the book in the new testament in case you don't know that um, i can't assume everybody does who's watching and then after that i'm going to pause because i know one or two people have been asking questions live some of you will see that not all of you will so i've got some questions from from last last week um and there may be questions today so what i won't do is be answering those as i give the reflection but um <coughs> excuse me shortly after i'll be addressing some of the questions if that's okay so it's good to be with you i'm going to um begin with a reading from Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in his last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact <coughs> representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. Got a bit of a <coughs> frog in my throat this morning. So, there's a lot more in Hebrews chapter 1. There's a lot more in the New Testament about the identity of Jesus. And some of the questions I, I get um, either here online or with people I've met over the years, um, I've always, always um, had a respectful and um, dignified approach to people from other faiths. And people from different backgrounds. I'm not offended by being asked questions. Um, I'm not threatened when people challenge me about my Christian faith. And I think the key to um, that approach is, is respect. And the other key is the fact that um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't brought up as a Christian. And when I was about 22, I had a very, very profound experience of the Holy Spirit. In those days, um, I used to be a skinhead, some people say I still am. Um, I was into punk, I went to football matches, I drunk a lot, um, and that's what my life consisted of when I was younger really. It was the pub, it was football matches, it was punk rock concerts, and like a lot, a lot of people just thinking, why on earth am I in this world? And I certainly um, had no um, expectation of a spiritual encounter that I had when I was 22. And that came after a short period of looking for the first time in my life at the New Testament because I had an experience that scared me, it was spiritual, and I thought what on earth is going on? And I began to read the New Testament, I began to read literature on other beliefs as well. As I was searching and to cut a very long story short there was a time in my life where I 
felt the Holy Spirit coming into me and transforming me. And if I hadn't had that experience, I wouldn't have thought it was possible to have it. And so I do what I do today as a, a minister in, in, in the Church of England, because I know there was a point in my life where God changed me. And since that point, and um, I won't tell you how old I am, but um, I've, I've been reading the Bible now for 40 years. And, you know, every day I read portions of, of, of scripture and and continually asking myself questions about my faith and what it means to everyday life. And over the course of that time, you know, I've done all kinds of jobs before I became a, um, a church minister. I've done sales work. Um, I was a labourer on building sites. I worked in factories. I worked in a pharmacy as a dispenser. I've done all kinds of different work. And I've met people in the course of my life and at work from lots of different backgrounds and had lots of interesting conversations. But for me, my faith comes back to passages such as Hebrews chapter 1, where it is clear from what the New Testament teaches that God's final word, his final message to the world is Jesus. And Jesus stands apart from all other religious teachers. And again, I say that with respect. There are different faiths who believe that their founders were prophets. And there are different faiths who would say that Jesus is a prophet. But if Jesus is just a prophet in the human sense, a human being inspired by God, then we have other passages in the Bible which actually paint a different picture of the identity of Jesus, which tell us he is more than just a man. And Hebrews chapter 1 is such a passage. But there are others that tell us that Jesus was born of a virgin. Why would an ordinary person need to be born of a virgin doesn't make any sense unless you then consider other teaching in the Bible which tells us that we have a problem and that problem is called sin we're familiar with sins you know we talk about sins the things that people do wrong but sin is also a condition which makes us do those things in the first place. You feel like it is the root and the things that we call sins are the things that grow from that root. And the Bible also teaches us that because sin has come into the world, the consequences of that are death. So if we say that we have no sin, which is another Bible verse, uh, we deceive ourselves, the Bible says, tells us and the truth is not in us if we say we have no sin the bible says that the wages of sin is death now ask yourself a question are you going to die am i going to die the answer is yes so why is the death in the world it is a consequence of sin because we have been severed from the gift of eternal life because of sin and with sin comes death and destruction and all the things which we see are negative and evil in this world. Sin has opened the door to the devil and his destruction. So the question is, how can all this be unraveled? Well, the only way that sin can be done away with is if somebody perfect does away with it. And that's why Jesus is different. He is perfect in his nature. He is God. Come to us. He is the Son of God. The only begotten of God. He is divine in his very nature. He is the eternal word, as the Gospel of John puts it in his first verse of the first chapter. But he's also fully human. And so we have 
two natures, if you like. We have the divine nature of Jesus. We have his humanity. And the reason is, we need somebody to live a perfect life and to give themselves as a perfect sacrifice for sin. And the only person who can do that, who is without sin, is Jesus. And that's why he is set apart from all other prophets, which I say with great respect. Because not only does he speak the word of God, Jesus, he is the word of God in himself. And that's why this passage in Hebrews says, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. The last message that God has for this world is, look to Jesus, because in him is eternal life. Now, there are lots of other questions um, which we would compose at this stage, but I want to um, pause the reflection there, and I want to open up to some questions. I've got some, actually, um, which I've got here, which have been sent to me or asked of me previously. And the other thing I'll, I'll say is that um, I'm not going to say who you are, online i mean people might be able to see your name but i'm not going to reveal who you are i'm just going to ask questions so that um we answer generally as it were and the other thing to say is well there won't be time to answer all the questions but you can always send me a message um on my page you know so you've got you've got the link there you can always send me a message and I will, will do my best to answer those questions. So, one question I've been asked, which is here, and then I will address some of the questions which are online there, is, has the Bible been changed? And if the Bible's been changed, how can we know it's God's true message? So the answer to that is, the Bible hasn't been changed, it's being translated, which is different. So a translation is from the original languages of the Old Testament, mostly Hebrew, but a little bit Aramaic, which is an everyday form of Hebrew, and the New Testament, which was written in Greek. Those have been translated into, from our point of view, into English. How do we know that that translation hasn't lost its meaning? Well, part of the answer is we've still got the original documents in the Hebrew and in the Greek. So um, what I have here, um, just let me turn the page for you, is um, I just want you to get to the only page. There we are. That's Hebrew. It's the Old Testament. And so if we turn to the, the first book, which is Genesis, we've got the original text. There we are. That's Genesis. There's a bit of Hebrew for you. Okay. And so um, if you ever go to a synagogue, they have scrolls. So that text is written by hand by scribes. And it's absolutely accurate. And it's checked and double checked. And in fact, there are ancient ver um, versions of the Hebrew scriptures in 1948. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in, in Israel, near a place called Qumran. Um, and the dryness of the caves where they found these scrolls, they were stored in, in, in clay jars, meant that the texts had been preserved. And, for example, some of the texts were of Isaiah. And when they compared the ancient Dead Sea Scrolls, which are from about... 200 BC, 200 years before Jesus. They check the Hebrew in um, the Isaiah text with the translations or um, the Hebrew now in the Isaiah text, the biblical Hebrew, and they were the same. And that's because the scribal tradition is so accurate that even if there's an error, they won't use the text. They will reverently um, make sure it's disposed of um, but if there's any inaccuracies, they won't check, they, they won't use the text. And then we have copies of the um, New Testament. So I'm going to um, 
just show you. Some of you watching will probably know this anyway, but just in case you don't, um, just let me find the, the, the pages are so thin um, in these Bibles. There we are. So I'll show you the cover. This is a Greek New Testament. There we are. And this is Matthew's Gospel. So you can see we've got the original text. So when we compare the English with those texts, we find that the translations are accurate. And there are people far more qualified than me to do that. There are people who dedicate their lives to biblical translation, who are experts in languages, in Hebrew and Greek and Latin and Aramaic and lots of different ancient languages. Um, we have experts who check and check and check so it can be verified that the bible texts we have are accurate so now i'm going to turn to some of the questions that are being asked um, so somebody's um, made a comment and it's a comment stroke question um, do you realize that this is all made up well that is very interesting so all i can say to you is this millions billions of people throughout the past 2000 years have been putting their faith in jesus christ and in some cases those people have died for their faith in jesus christ they were so convinced some of the people so convinced in Jesus Christ, his first disciples were Jews who had everything to lose by following Jesus in terms of being rejected by the community because some Jewish people didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Some did. And the original disciples of Jesus were Jewish. Of the 12 disciples, with the exclusion of Judas, who betrayed Jesus, but uh, Matthias was chosen to be one of the twelve. Those twelve, with others, went into the ancient world, a world that was multi-faith, a world that was full of different philosophies, and they proclaimed the name of Jesus. With the exception of John, who lived to um, quite an old age, but was exiled for his faith on the island of Patmos, so he was persecuted. The other 11, church history tells us, were martyred. They were killed for their faith and for their testimony in Jesus Christ. They were so convinced that the experience they had was real, it was worth giving their lives for. I cannot prove that in a scientific way, but all I can say to you is I know there was a point in my life when I had an encounter with God. And what I will do is point you to a verse um, which is in the book of Psalms, which says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. So in other words, we don't really know it's true until we decide to follow the truth for ourselves. Christianity is an experience. Yes, we think about it intellectually, we, we can reason the Christian faith and come to good conclusions about the Christian faith, but ultimately we are called to follow Jesus. And it is the nature of faith that as we follow Jesus, we find out who he is. That's how it was with the first disciples. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, two disciples of John the Baptist follow Jesus, and Jesus turns to them and says, what is it you want? And they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And those two disciples end up um, following Jesus because Jesus says, well, come and see. And they end up coming and seeing for the rest of their lives because the life of faith is a journey. And it's not about having all the answers. We can't know the answer to every single question, but it's having enough faith. And faith comes through a relationship with Jesus that we become more and more convinced of the truth of our faith. So that's what I would say to anybody who says it's a made up story. Have you tried this for yourself?
Have you invited Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Saviour? Have you tried to follow him? I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about the church, even though as Christians we are the church and we gather in church buildings to worship. I'm not talking about the institution. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Until we've entered on that journey, then we can't say whether it's true or not. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Or, as my mother used to say to us as kids, we'd say, Mum, what's for tea? What's this? She'd say, suck it and see. <laughs> so, suck it and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So, um, and if you if you want to doubt that, great. You know, um, I'm not, um, not going to fall out with you. But... You know, don't come back at me and say, oh, it's not true, it's not, it's not true. Try it out. Try it out. That's all I can say to you. Follow Jesus, because our faith is based upon him. And he says, whoever turns to me, I will never cast away. He's waiting and he's full of compassion. What else do we have? Um... Why is it that d diseases exist? Um, disease and sickness has come into the world as part of the consequences of sin. So sin, um, original sin, which I believe the Bible teaches, um, has opened the door to death. And with death comes decay. So Adam and Eve were meant to live forever. But sin opened the door to death. And they were told that, um, you know, there was a certain tree that they couldn't eat of, which was the tree, f uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, but there's also another tree called the tree of life, which they weren't um, meant to eat from. Um, what, wh why was that? Well, I think they probably could have eaten from the tree of life. But once they'd opened um, eaten of the fruit of the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil, they disobeyed God's direct command not to eat of it. And so they were prevented from eating from the tree of life. And the reason is, sin had entered their lives and sin had entered the world. If they'd eaten from the tree of life, they would have been in their sin forever. So therefore life can only come now through the gift of God. And with sin comes death and with death comes decay. That our bodies grow older. And I don't know about you. I'm sure that when you look in the mirror. You're getting younger every day. But it's certainly not true of me. And part of this aging. And part of this decay. Is that our bodies are not the way they should be. And we are prone to sickness. And disease. Which comes as a consequence. Of we followed the devil. In terms of opening the door to original sin. It was never God's will for us to be sick and to suffer from disease or illness. And so part of the restoration comes through Jesus. And you will see that when we get into the Gospels and we look at the ministry of Jesus, he's come to undo the works of the devil. He's come to undo the consequences of sin. He's come to bring the kingdom of God into a world that's followed the kingdom of darkness. Jesus comes as a light into the world to shine a light on the kingdom of God. And the signs of the kingdom of God coming into the world <coughs> are that Jesus heals. That Jesus del delivers people from demonic oppression, which is another form of healing of the soul and the spirit and the mind. And there isn't a situation of sickness that Jesus meets that he can't heal. He also raises people from the dead, including Lazarus. And you can read about that in John's Gospel, chapter 11. So that's why the disease and sickness in the world. But part of the healing comes when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. Because it means uh, our souls and our spirits are secure for eternity. And that's where healing begins from the inside out. We will all, at some point, get sick and grow older and die. But the good news is, 
that Jesus will ultimately conquer all of that. And in fact, at St. Thomas's Church, we have once a month a, a regular um, service where we pray for healing. And God touches people in different ways. He doesn't always touch us in the way that we expect, but he blesses people when they come forward for prayer. And we do that because we believe that when Jesus, and before Jesus ascended, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them, well, baptizing them in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, but teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And what did Jesus teach and command his disciples? To preach, to heal, and to restore. And so when Jesus has ascended on high, we read in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which comes straight after the Gospels, that the healing ministry of Jesus continues, and he does it through his disciples. After the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured a, a, out upon them and the church, and they move into what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and being empowered to live for Jesus in this world. So, today there are testimonies of people who are healed. There are testimonies of people whose lives have been transformed because we believe that Jesus is alive. Which is another reason, going back to what I was saying earlier, that, that sets Jesus apart from the prophets. You can go to the tombs of the prophets, but if you try to find the tomb of Jesus, you will see it's empty because he's in heaven seated at the right hand side of the father maybe i'll take um one more right so there are some people um who are finding this um amusing saying this is not real well it's for you to find out actually and, you know, ultimately, all of us were told that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So whether you believe him or whether you don't, the Bible is saying one day we will face him. And it will ask the question, what have you done with your life? And what did you do with the message that you heard about me? I leave that with you. Somebody's asking um, about basically abuse in the church. Well, the reason there's been abuse in the church, which is devastating, the church should be the safest place in the world, and it's a tragedy when abuse happens. But the reason abuse happens in the church is the same reason abuse happens everywhere else. In the government, in the armed forces, in the police, in the health service, in, in every single walk of life, in, in health care, sadly, there's been abuse. And that's because in all of those institutions, you find people. And not everybody behaves in the way that they should. Whenever that happens, it's a tragedy, it's devastating, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, an apology doesn't even go close to expressing what you've experienced, if that's you watching this. What we are trying to do in the Church of England is make safeguarding absolutely as tight and effective as possible. And if there's ever a situation, the report it, tell somebody, don't keep it within you. And those things will be looked into with all seriousness, all seriousness. Um, but it is awful when that happens and it shouldn't happen. And I would say, especially in the church, because that should be the safest place in the world. The church should be a place of healing and restoration. And when it isn't that, that is devastating and we fall short of what we should be as Christians and as a church. 
I'll take one more and then I'm going to close with a word of prayer. But thank you for being with me this morning. And as I said earlier, you can always send me a message. I'm trying to look actually, I'm trying to read. Let's have a look. Oh, it's a question about um, God creating the world in six days and ancient fossils. Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? So the Bible speaks of six little days that God created the heavens and the earth. But in terms of um, time as we know it, if you like, time as we know it doesn't begin until the fall. And the reason is um, we're in a state of eternity. So yes, God creates the world in, in six days, but that's before sin enters the world and, and brokenness enters the world. Also, it does say um, in the Bible that um, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. Now that doesn't mean it took God 6,000 years, but what we don't know is when creation started, because we don't know how long um, Adam and Eve were alive before they sinned. We just don't know. So in terms of God creating the world in six days, that is still possible. Why? Because he's God. But we don't know the time period really from the beginning of creation until Adam and Eve sinned. And then we start to count time because after that you will notice that the people who follow Adam and Eve um, it gives um, a span to their lives they lived this many years and then they died they lived this many years and then they died that isn't mentioned before sin enters the world and so I don't think there's a contradiction between God's creation and fossils in fact some of the most committed Christians I know are scientists and did you know by the way that the origins of science were mainly from people who had faith in God. And the reason science emerged out of that faith community was this. People believed that God created the heavens and the earth. Science was a process of asking, how did he do it? So the origins of science are with what we call theism, those who believe in a deity. So examine it. I don't think um, the finding of fossils contradicts the Bible at all. I think both complement one another beautifully. I'm going to finish there and um, God willing, I'll see you again and we'll share some time together. I'll put a notice um, on the page to tell you when that is. Let's pause and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the questions that have been asked today. We pray that you would help us in our search for the truth. That we would know your blessing. And Lord Jesus, as you taught us to pray, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Bless you. <coughs> and good to share with you this morning. Do have um, a blessed day with whatever you're doing. And hopefully I'll see you online in the near future. God bless you.